thank you for staying with us and we've been talking with Dr Richard Pastel. Richard, how was your experience of the, the Great Walk to Beijing? Because this is why you're obviously in China. Well, this is uh, it's a, certainly an extraordinary place. It's incredible to walk along this wall. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of things that really struck me. I think uh, in, in some ways it was a sense of um, being with my parents uh, who'd passed away from cancer. And, and I think the reason that I was thinking about that was that everybody who was on the wall had come there as part of a personal experience where they'd lost someone who was very important to them to, to cancer. And so there was this remarkable shared experience of uh, a common loss. And that, that to me was a um, very uh, important part of the experience. And the second part of it was the way in which everyone had responded to that. Mm -hmm. I think it was Oliver also Holmes who said, uh, it is essential to be part of the passion and action of our times, lest we be judged as not having lived at all. And what I saw there were people who were involved in the passion and action of our times. Everyone who was on that wall was part of this action. You know, my hope is we look at the last century, that was the internet um, and the vaccines of polio. And what I see in this century will be the eradication of cancer globally. Mm -hmm. This is what will take place and we are part of that process. So that was very exciting. Um, and I also felt the sense of hope that came out of everything we were doing. Everyone was very positive and optimistic every step of the way. And I think everyone's mind was focused on the positive aspects of everything we were doing. It was mm. quite extraordinary. Mm. And every step, I mean, part of, obviously, Olivia, <coughs> excuse me, um, the metaphor she uses that, you know, in, in that walk, the great walk to Beijing, there were some very challenging times. There were some times, some of us wondered, you know, can we keep going? Mm. And she likens that to the, the journey of healing cancer from the body. When you're saying about the eradication of cancer, what, in your understanding, if it's possible to know this, causes cancer? You know, how, how does cancer start in the first place? Mm. Well, it's, it's two main things. Mm. There's the, the genes that we're born with mm. and there's the environment we live in. Mm -hmm. And the, the environment we live in, we can, we can change. So we know that our world has changed a lot over the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. Types of environmental toxins, um, cigarette smoking of course has been with us for a very long time. Uh, obesity is becoming a real problem. We know that fat cells promote the growth of cancer cells. So globesity, as we call it, is a major cause of maintaining and perhaps initiating cancer. There are studies that suggest that there are changes that actually occur in, in the breast um, of animals during pregnancy. So the, the fetuses actually, the breast of the fetuses actually change in response to the fat in the body of the mother. What? Oh, okay. So it starts very, very early. So <coughs> these are the, the three big ones, I think. Um, the environmental toxins, the effects of t tobacco smoke, and uh, perhaps uh, another important toxin that we deal with is uh, excess alcohol. Mm -hmm. So these are all important drivers in cancer. And then the, the genes that we're born with. Yep. And my, my thinking about the genes we're born with is the wellness genes. We've very much focused in the past on the, the cancer-causing genes, people who are predisposed to, to cancer, and that is important. Um, what we're trying to do is use these genes to, to stratify the types of treatment we give our patients so that the treatments aren't so harmful to them. We try and focus on targeting the therapies and personalising the therapies so that patients have a better experience with chemotherapy and other traditional approaches. But I'm, I'm particularly excited about the idea of wellness genes. I've, never not, I've not yeah. heard that term before. Well, you know, you see Excellent. this. Excellent. You, 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 know, you, you see these people and, you know, their parents lived to be, you know, 99. My grandfather was mm -hmm. 98 when he died. In fact, he was here when he was uh, 81, backpacking around China. Really? Yeah. And so I was very glad to get here a bit earlier. He actually bought a glove puppet of a koala bear and uh, was entertaining children when he was here. Oh, and it's a cool. Very, yeah, it's a love of life. But I think there are these genes which are wellness genes, and I believe that is a huge opportunity for us to understand why it is many people don't get cancer. And this, I think, is an important focus of, of our research in the future. Okay. Now, let's just say that you had a diagnosis of cancer, you know, heaven forbid. 
what would you do, given you're a doctor and you work in this field, what would you do to bring about um, a healing in your body? Well, I think there are, you know, it's a balance. You mm -hmm. know, there's this uh, Hopi Indian word, Haina mm -hmm. life out of balance. And I think it's really important that a balanced approach is taken. And if you like, we sometimes break it into Western and Eastern thinking or Western and Eastern culture. But I really see the, the response should be a marriage of the two. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a mind-body approach, a holistic approach. And in the United States, the best cancer care is given through what we call uh, National Cancer Institute Designated Cancer Centres. So there's really an elite group <laughs> of cancer centres and those cancer centres really, uh, they have an exam every five years yeah. and the directors of those cancer centres get examined to make sure they have com com complete a, an appropriate portfolio of treatments for all the, the cancers that come in. And so the Kimmel Cancer Centre at Jefferson in Philadelphia is an NCI designated, National Cancer Institute designated cancer centre. Now these were set up as a result of legislation um, by the US government. One of the great things Nixon did um, was to open up China um, and to start this war on, on cancer, as he called it. And he designated these National Cancer Institute designated cancer centres to be part of that war on cancer. So that's very important to get the best holistic cancer care. However, I think it's important to be a place where these alternative, or we call them integrative medicine approaches are used. And uh, at, at the Kimmel Cancer Centre, we have a, a complementary and alternative medicine centre. And uh, it, uh, it was referred to the, as the Myrna Brin Centre, named after a donor's wife. And uh, this, this centre has, a, you know, it's a beautiful facility. We have the trickling water, we have the, the uh, nice warm wood floors, we have the lighting, um, we have the quiet music and we have the appropriate sense of dignity and uh, healing within the physical environment. And we have that architecture throughout the cancer care facility so that the, the physical facilities for the chemotherapy suites for example have that same sense of healing, mm -hmm. that same sense of the physical environment that is uh, putting the patient at, at peace and in a, in a positive mood. And so this physical architecture is part of, I believe, the holistic caring. Um, we covered our seats with these, uh, when patients have chemotherapy, their, their skin becomes very sensitive. They have a, a quilt, yeah. which was personalised. Yeah. Um, so these sort of other components to make people feel like they're not a stranger mm -hmm. in the hospital, yeah. that people care for them personally. Mm -hmm. uh, the quilts are part of that process of personalising the care for our patients. Yeah. And again, we try and have the philosophy of the caregiver. The philosophy of the caregiver is so very, very important. Mm -hmm. um, I've always believed that we're here to serve. You know, it's a, a patient-oriented approach where we're really a vehicle to help our patients, to serve our patients. It's not about the doctors, it's about the patients. And so we bring all the components of cancer care to the patient, integrated, holistic health care. And I love what you're saying, <clears throat> excuse me, what you're saying there, because it is that thing, isn't it? If we hold that person in a positive thought form and believe that they are well, mm -hmm. then that is part of the healing process. I, I, be I believe that. Mm. Um, it might take a long while before we can formally prove this, mm. um, but we do know that patients can kill their own cancer. Mm. We know that patients do cure their own cancer. Mm. Um, I see personally time and time again over the last more than 20 years patients who with a positive attitude put their cancer out of their mind and out of their body. Um, and there are classic examples of this. Um, Lance Armstrong, I think if you read his book, spectacular example of the way in which a person's mind balanced with their, their own body eradicated their cancer. Um, so I, I think that there are tremendous opportunities for us to bring these types of wellness approaches to the culture in the developed and in the developing world. A culture mm. of service for our patients yeah. and a culture of feeling for our patients. Yeah. And I would ask, you know, this is a plea to ask every doctor to put themselves in the shoes of their patients so they see the experience that patient is going through because it will be much more fulfilling for the doctor, uh, for their lives and much more fulfilling for the patient's experience because this is a very 
symbiotic relationship, doctor-patient relationship. Mm, absolutely. We'll take another break and come back and hear a bit more from, uh, from Richard. Stay with us. <laughs>